the Morgan Stanleys of the world will take a spreadsheet and say every junior project is going to come on online on time and the price is going to crater. They're calling for the spot price to be 13000 for Carbonate, the China spot price, at the end of this year. And I'm just calling bullshit on that because I, I don't know if it's going to 70, but there's no reason why it can't go to 70. And the, the EV revolution isn't going to be stopped by the price of lithium. It's going to be delayed by the lack of lithium. My next guest is, almost needs no introduction. Joe Lowry is the CEO and founder of Global Lithium LLC. Joe, it's been a long time. Welcome back. Well, thank you, James. I'm glad we are transitioning back from cannabis to lithium. But I'm glad to be uh, back in the realm of uh, new clean energy. And on that note, Joe, I was listening to your podcast the other day, which for listeners who want to expand their understanding of lithium in the most extraordinary way, I highly recommend Joe's podcast. Just Google Joe Lowry Lithium and you'll come across his podcast. Uh, but I was listening to your podcast uh, that you did on your opinions about DLE. And in that, uh, DLE, for the audience who don't know, is direct lithium extraction, which refers to a group of methodologies for extracting lithium from brine material, almost entirely brines. And those brines can originate from geothermal operations, from petrochemical produced oil storage uh, geological structures. They can be from salars, which are the naturally occurring volcanic originated lithium concentrated deposits, in, mostly in South America. Uh, or if they can be synthesized brines, which was something I found interesting. But um, you mentioned, and, and here's the interesting thing about DLEs, let me just preface this, is that there are a lot of DLE technologies out there raising capital and at various stages of pilot experimentation, but there are none who have achieved commercial production using direct lithium extraction methodologies. Correct me if I'm wrong, Joe. Let me just clarify. A lot of people, now that DLE has become a, a much hyped thing, people go back and say, well, FMC Lithium, now Live Vent, has been doing DLE in Argentina for over 20 years. FMC has been operating now live in Argentina for over 20 years. And they use what I'd like to call a modified DLE because they still have to use ponds. So it's not the, usually when you hear about DLE, people will say, well, we can, instead of having a year in ponds or 18 months in ponds, we can do our cycles less than a week or some even say a day. So that's what I, I just want to clarify that what FMC is doing, I would call a hybrid DLE. So I still maintain that there is no commercial DLE in operation. And if you had looked at my Twitter account this morning, you would have seen that uh, standard lithium, which is a special situation with uh, using a bromine extraction plants uh, stream. They, I believe, will likely be the first commercial DLE. They've made another step and they, they put out an announcement today. But they're still, I mean, in, in a demonstration plant level, they're, they're not a tiny, you know, we made 500 grams of battery grade, which is the, tends to be the announcements you see from, from all these juniors that are hyping their DLE process. Uh, there's one particular in South America that said, their MD said on uh, a podcast that we're on track to be in the top four lithium producers. And then he said in, in 2022, our goal in the first six months is to make, I think it was 2.2 metric tons. <laughs> so there's, there's a disconnect between the hype and this is much hyped right now because it's also purported to be greener. And then you get into the debate about is brine water. And I would just say to that, go drink a cup of brine and, and see how your body reacts to that. <laughs> but some of the DLE technologies actually use much more fresh water than brine operations using conventional ponds. So you really need to peel back the onion on a particular project you're interested in. You said it well, and you're the first person that's ever asked me about DLE on a podcast 
that kind of got it right from the beginning that it's, it's a range of different technologies. DLE is not a thing. It's not a drop in. It has to be customized to the resource you're trying to extract the lithium from. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the intriguing aspect of DLE, which lends itself so well to the promotional impetus of junior capital markets is that it's very hard for a lay person to, to consider all of the different factors surrounding a direct lithium extraction technology. And now, so in direct lithium extraction, there's a basically a solvent extraction, a filtration approach, and a ion exchange approach. Those are the three broad archetypes, I would say, of DLE. Am I still on track? Yeah, I, I'm not gonna, there's a wide range. And, and I won't, wouldn't even limit it to those three, but I think I think you framed it pretty well. But if I say yes to that question, I'm going to get hate mail because I left somebody out. So, <laughs> okay, so we'll just say for our for the sake of discussion, we're we'll okay for the sake of discussion. Those three types, acknowledging that there are always different and new things coming along out there that we might not be aware of yet. But um, so then you've got, of course, you've got to consider the the chemical composition of the subject brine that is going to be extracted directly, whose lithium is going to be extracted directly. And then you've got to consider the, the sort of the infrastructure environment, the geography of where is this brine going to be coming from. And then of course you have the, uh, the, have the resulting output. Is it going to be carbonate? Is it going to be hydroxide? Is it going to be concentrate? Is it going to be some derivative thereof? And so, Within that sort of massive context, Joe, what is the holy grail in terms of DLE? What would the best DLE technology look like? Well, let's just take a step back in, in the, the direct lithium extraction piece of this. Usually they're, they're going to make an intermediate from which carbonate or, chloride or hydroxide are going to be made from. So I, I don't link the and chemical product necessarily to the, the base, the extraction piece of it. You can if you want to, but let's say, let's just go back to live end. They made either carbonate or chloride from the brine that was a result of, of their process. And then because they had, a, had an existing hydroxide plant that was used carbonate as the feedstock, they continued along those lines. Although they did do pilot work with uh, what was called salt splitting back in the 90s where they could have made hydroxide directly. But at the time, the hydroxide market was very small. And that's, that's probably something we ought to talk about. There's a lot of different thinking now about the product of the future just because of some cathode uh, developments that have happened. And now Elon Musk is using lithium iron phosphate in addition to NCA in his cars and saying the majority of his cars will probably be iron based in the future. I'm getting a little bit off the DLE answer, but it isn't, uh, it isn't important whether you focus on it being hydroxide or carbonate. It's I'm waiting to see the Holy grail to me is the first working real DLE operation. I draw the analogy that it's kind of like the four minute mile when Bannister ran the four minute mile in the next couple of years, a lot of people did. And I think that's what will happen is once we have a true DLE, you will see more of them happen in succession in the ensuing half a decade. But we're still waiting. Yeah, right. Okay, so in the podcast, you mentioned that standard lithium was the leading contender and you just repeated that. Um, so t tell me, what do you know about standard lithium's, uh, bro you said it was a bromine? Yeah, it's a bromine operation. It is actually the same way that Albemarle originally sought to enter the lithium market before they bought Rockwood. They have, there's, they have a bromine operation in Magnolia, Arkansas. Lanxis has one in El Dorado, Arkansas. And they both, I mean, you, this is going back when DLE was really in its infancy. Uh, more than 10 years ago, Albemarle actually tried to do the same thing. And I, I think Standard now is much further ahead because obviously Albemarle bought Rockwood, they're focused on other things. They still talk from time to time about developing uh, extraction in the, from the smack over brines. 
But the real point is, if you look at what Standard's done, now you've got Coke Industries, one of the largest private companies in the world, investing in Standard, which I also believe was a validation because that's not a company that uh, just throws their money wildly at uh, projects. They're a very analytical group. So I, I would still say Standard's the leading contender, but the real, the real importance of that, let's just take a step back. When you look at deploying DLE in South America, a lot of times it's a choice. We could do DLE or we could do ponds. In Arkansas, it isn't a choice. You can't do ponds in Arkansas. You probably can't do ponds anywhere in North America and be really successful. Albemarle does it at Silver Peak, but that's a tiny operation. What I believe is when you get a DLE win, the real importance there is it's going to unlock, potentially unlock, assets that couldn't operate any other way. And let's, let's, we can look at that or the salt and sea. And, you know, the salt and sea now, there's a lot of hype around the salt and sea. And everybody likes to talk about Berkshire Hathaway being involved through Mid-America Energy. And, you know, there's a lot of government hype there as well. But the salt and sea has been out there for well over a decade. And Symbol tried. Symbol ultimately was not successful, although Elon Musk offered, I believe it was $325 million to buy out Symbol when Symbol was just a small pilot and some IP. So there you go. The economics of DLE is affected by a whole range of factors, um, not least of which I'm going to sort of segue into the sorbent category of the DLE technologies, where essentially a, an engineered material is designed to selectively filter out lithium salts from the other constituents of the brine uh, that it can. And uh, in some chemical configurations of these sorbents, they have to filter out some of the other imp impurities, which sort of clog up the sorbents right away. Now, the cost of a sorbent is, is a fixed number, arguably. And uh, the number of times you can reuse the sorbent to pass the brine through to collect lithium in economically viable quantities is a matter of, you know, that's now that's where we get into the, the meat of how good is a sorbent technology? How many times can you reuse it without having to put in fresh sorbent beads at X millions of dollars per ton? So in the sorbent space, I'm aware of a private company that says it can do 300 cycles before it needs to replace its sorbent materials. And you tell me that that's nothing, nothing major. I would just say that until you prove it at a commercial scale and you have the whole cost structure of the DLE operation, just saying we can do 300 sorbent cycles doesn't make me say hallelujah. So in your context, what would a what would a company have to do in order to impress you sufficiently that you would say well this is intriguing and now i'm going to follow it or maybe invest in it or you know offer my services as a consultant what does that company have to become i i want to see something that to me is of a is looks like it's scalable and Everybody, there isn't a junior out there that doesn't claim they made 99 point, something over 99.5 in the lab. Everybody can do that. It's, it's kind of like a party trick. Right. The point is when you get to a certain scale, I mean, and that's why I like what Standard's done. They've, they've done it at a small scale. Now they have a demonstration plant. They can go from brine to carbonate. They've demonstrated that. That was part of the announcement today. Yeah. I bought Standard at 30 cents Canadian. Wow. And, you know, it's gone over 10. Yeah. I don't know. You know, today it's, it's, it's selling it less than that. I'm not sure what it is. But I'm, this is not investing advice. Because there were a lot of great lithium buys at the beginning of COVID. And I availed myself of several of them. Yeah. But, uh, right. You know, okay. I mean, that's, I can't, you know, I mean, we, n nobody knows the future, but if, if we're going to talk in the DLE realm, I believe that there will be more than one successful DLE operation by 2026, but I'm not, I'm not picking who's number two or number three. Right. 
Uh, in Chile, the uh, election of a leftist government, to say the least, has yeah, uh, yeah. you know has a lot of people wondering what how that's going to affect not just lithium production but copper production as well, being the number one copper producer in the world. Um, so I've heard that there's, uh, or I've read rather, that there's an expectation for him to limit the permitting of new salt pond operations in an effort to curb fresh water usage by the lithium industry. And then of course there's the persistent fear that there's going to be a degree of nationalization to occur at least over the revenues that originate in the lithium space in Chile. Which of those concern you the most or do either of them concern you at all? I don't think the new president and, and SQM's deal goes until 2030, as I recall, and Albemarle's into the 2040s. And those deals, when you're, when you're getting 40%, the government's getting 40% of the increment of price above 10000 and they're getting money before that because it's a stair-step royalty plan. They're not going to turn that money down. I think you'll see more ESG taught rhetoric. I think you'll see more questioning about how the indigenous people are being treated. But that, but Eduardo Betran did a, really a great job of restructuring those deals back when we, when we used to talk, James, before you left me for cannabis. In closing, what is your prognosis for the price of lithium in 2022? I think when you've been in the industry as long as I have and you've seen ups and downs, you have to go back and check yourself because we've never seen, I mean, the price in China, the spot price of lithium carbonates over 50,000 now. And when we, when we were talking before in the, in the last cycle, it, it touched 30,000. And I think people now are saying, well, that's too high. Well, what does too high mean? I mean, it, what, what you have now, what's different this time is in 2016, the whole commodity camp, five or so mines, depending on how you, what you want to count the restart of Mount Catlin, but a number of mines came on. The industry went from undersupply to oversupply quickly, but it was an artificially created undersupply in the first place based on the act of the largest spodumene producer on the planet. ED penetration was about 1%. The difference this time is one, you don't have a number of new mines coming online anytime soon in, in Australia. South America is still, you'll have Kachari start startup in the second half of this year, you have some, you know, meager improvement in what the Atacama does, but we're not going to keep up. Demand's good, probably going to go up 150 to 180,000 tons this year. That's about what the market was the first time I talked to you. Right. And so you, you don't have the ability to catch up quickly. Now, the Morgan Stanleys of the world will take a spreadsheet and say every junior project is going to come on online on time and the price is going to crater. They're calling for the spot price to be 13000 for carbonate, the China spot price, at the end of this year. And I'm just calling bullshit on that because I, I don't know if it's going to 70, but there's no reason why it can't go to 70. And the, the EV revolution isn't going to be stopped by the price of lithium it's going to be delayed by the lack of lithium. Hmm. Interesting. Joe, we're going to have to leave it there. I'm going to have you back soon enough, and uh, we'll leave it there for now. Well, thank you, James. We'll talk to you soon, Joe.